Welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Executive Podcast. I'm Joe Sullivan, your host and a co-founder of the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla76. I've talked about the skilled labor gap and resulting labor shortage with a lot of manufacturing people over the last year. And I've heard this topic addressed from a variety of angles, robotics, reshoring, apprenticeships, job shops inside the walls of high schools. All of these are amazing things and viable solutions, and they all work even better when you start putting them together. But not until my conversation with today's two guests did I really hear anyone talking about one of the most viable solutions to this massive skills gap problem and a solution that's right under our noses. And that's advocating for diversity in the manufacturing workforce. I think today's episode may be the most important one I've recorded to date. So if you listen to this and you believe in what these two incredible manufacturing leaders are saying as much as I do, please share this with someone you know. On that note, let me introduce my guests. Drew Crow has been referred to as the leader of the new American manufacturing renaissance. Drew is one of the leading minds and movers on the front lines in the critical battle of closing the workforce and skills gap in the manufacturing industry. He's one of the most sought after speakers and consultants in the space, teaching manufacturing industry leaders how to reach, hire, and retain the next generation in manufacturing. Drew is also one of the leading influencers responsible for growing awareness of the industry among our youth and is at the forefront of training the next generation of skilled manufacturing industry leaders. He's doing the work to build the bridge between the manufacturing industry, the youth, and our communities through collaborative efforts, organic reach, and private and public partnerships. Justin Sherman is the founder of Equity Machine Works in Washington State and a thought leader on workforce development and organizational culture. Justin focuses on collaborative engagements, breaking down barriers, and compounding strategies to grow and diversify our industry workforce. He travels to consult for businesses, NGOs, and local government in support of their efforts and for speaking and media engagements for the industry. Justin's background, knowledge, and experience lend him unique skill sets to address some of our overlapping community and industry challenges. This, coupled with deep empathy for all stories and his thrive and help thrive mentality, make Justin a force for positive and productive change. Drew and Justin, welcome to the show, guys. Thank you very much, Joe. Excited to be here, man. Excited to have you guys. Um, and since since we first talked in person a month or two ago, Andrew and I actually got to meet up in person uh, in the flesh for a beer, which was pretty awesome here in St. Louis. Uh, it was at Rockwell. It, it had been at my, on my list, man. One of the, the coolest places that I've seen in St. Louis, man. I appreciate the invitation. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the it two of us. Combo. It was, it was. We, Andrew, or, um, Drew, I, I'm always calling you Andrew, Drew, I, you go by both, but uh, we, we met up with Chris Lukey, who I'm sure some of our listeners know, uh, host of Manufacturing Happy Hour podcast, another one you should be listening to if you're not, anybody who's who's uh, tuning in here. Um, and this is, this is a, like one of the things I just love about being a podcast host is just the people I've met. And, you know, Drew, you, you're, you're a St. Louis guy. I never knew you. Like, I saw you around LinkedIn a little bit and then more and more over the last year as you've really kind of seemed to pick up steam there and, and stuff. But um, it, it's just cool the way I think this podcasting experience has connected me to other people who are influencing manufacturing and hearing their stories and making me smarter. So, uh, but yeah, it was, it was great to actually see somebody in the flash, you know, after this year and three months plus of, of COVID and stuff. So we had a, had a 70 degree, like, which is not not common in St. Louis for anybody who doesn't know St. Louis. And once June rolls around, it's like 90s and humid. So um, anyway, that was good stuff. Well, guys, we have a very important topic of discussion lined up for today. And I'm thrilled to have you both here because you're doing some stuff together. You've also got different backgrounds and unique perspectives on this topic. Um, and we've got a lot to cover. So I'm, I'm, let's just get right into this thing. Yeah, let's go for it. Awesome. So I'm going to tee you guys up with a very broad question to kick this off. Why is diversity in the manufacturing sector so important and why right now? So, I mean, in simple terms, your business won't survive if you don't engage with it. Um, you know, we got, I guess, you know, a lot to get into, but, uh, you know, really kind of just comes down to the fact that 
common culture is changing. The demographics of, you know, our nation are changing and that's continuing to happen. And those that engage in this space more effectively, you're going to be the ones that, that win. So, I mean, it, you know, it really matters, but, you know, from that, you know, the more important thing is, I guess, you know, creating, uh, you know, opportunity and inclusivity within our industry and really making it more attractive to, you know, younger, more diverse generation overall. And, uh, you know, really making, uh, these, these workspaces, you know, something, something folks want to be a part of, particularly when, you know, we're looking at competing with other industries. If you look at, um, St. Louis, you know, we're both very familiar with it. And St. Louis is, uh, a city that looks like a lot of the major cities. It kind of mirrors a Chicago or Detroit where a lot of the manufacturing has left uh, the city proper. And we see the effects of uh, the jobs that leave, the tax money that leaves, um, and the opportunity that leaves along with it, right? So um, our cities and our inner cities are, they're dying and um, they're getting a little bit rougher because it seems like there's a lot of scarcity. And manufacturing um, is one of the things that, that can solve those. Uh, scarcity issues and those jobs issues uh, because most of our entry level jobs pay very high. So um, we definitely have to bring it back and include uh, the areas that most of the population uh, is going to need it. Number one. Number two, um, you know, we're in a field where, you know, we're creators, right? And, and we're innovators, right? Whether we're making parts that we've been making the same way since like the 1930s or 1950s, we're thinking of new processes. Uh, there's new tools that are coming out every day. We're trying to make that process more efficient and faster so we can spread out our margins, right? And um, when we have a lot of people that come from similar backgrounds and similar experiences, you don't really get that diversity of thought. And we're leaving out a lot of different angles and creativity and innovation uh, that will help us compete on a global scale because this is a global market, you know, and this is a global um, industry, right? So um, like, like Justin said earlier, it's critical at this point. When we're looking at the, the jobs that are coming back that are unfilled. We're looking at all of the reshoring efforts and the Made in USA resurgence. And, um, you know, none of that means anything if we can't actually, uh, you know, um, deliver on that promise and deliver on those statements by making the parts, right? And when other fields are becoming more inclusive and they're becoming more, you know, um, you know, diverse, um, it's more attractive to the youth that are looking to get into jobs. So, you know, it's turning off and turning away some of our talent um, most of our talent and, and we're, we're losing out on our sector because of it. We can't effectively close the skills gap without, you know, addressing this as a core issue. You know, we definitely plan on getting into some demographic numbers later to kind of, you know, explain with hard data, you know, what this looks like, but, um, you know, we've already got a tremendous amount of open jobs and as retirements continue to accelerate, you know, assuming we don't, after we find out what the data looks like from COVID and how many retirements happened happened through that, I know at Boeing there were a ton, um, and so that's going to mean a lot more open jobs. But reshoring means demand increasing a lot, and you know it's just going to it's going to compound a crisis level. You know if we're not even if we're not considering where it's at right now, that and so engaging with um, you know a larger potential workforce in ways that you know see them include them attract them to this industry, um, that's going to help us close that skills gap a lot faster. And the demographics we're going to go over later is going to point that out so clearly. Um, let's, let's go there. Let's, um, let's just get into it while we're talking about it. You know, what, what, is, what is the demographics? I know you guys have some, some data you've, you've pulled from some studies and things, but what, like, what's it look like in the manufacturing sector for people who may not really realize how, how extreme some of the numbers are? So, if we go just, you know, straight for gender demographics, 14% mm -hmm. of manufacturing is female, mm -hmm. but that doesn't account for skilled positions. That's not just skilled positions. That's everything. And, you know, us and most anybody else that's going to be listening to this podcast can look back on their experience and see what, you know, 
what that typically ends up look, looking like. And so if we sort of like center down to machinists, you know, Drew and I's background, it's 95 or it's 90, sorry, 94.9% male. So 5.1% female. And how this, how this makes impact is, you know, when, when men are the only representation or, you know, we could really kind of like do this for anything where it's like, you know, if there's only one group that is the only rep representation or the dominant force or the only ones in power, only decisions are kind of made from their perspective and they can't necessarily know exactly how to sort of like properly engage. Like otherwise, it's why diver like thought diversity is super important. Um, but it also creates, you know, cultures that are centered around maleness, right? And if we think about, you know, what that looks like, you know, when, when we're growing up and, you know, everything that we see and, you know, it, it doesn't create an inclusive environment for women and you end up with things that really are a lot of the stuff that we, that ends up turning folks away. So there's, uh, you know, I have personal connections to folks that have left industry because of uh, basically like just oppressive, like gender focused, like dress code requirements, mm -hmm. you know, so have quite literally got two contradictory stories where like women are not allowed to wear skirts because they're too distracting. And then the exact opposite, which is women weren't allowed to wear pants because they were too masculine. Like, we don't even know if that's necessarily legal or not, but nobody's really doing anything about that kind of stuff. And these stories aren't uncommon. And they're sort of born from this sort of, you know, demographic disparity that happens, right? If you had, if you had women at the table making the decision, they definitely wouldn't have been putting that rule in there, right? Um, and so that's just like one small way that it impacts things. That's 85.5% white manufacturing. Um, and, you know, that is definitely not the, the makeup of, you know, our, our racial diversity in this, in this country either. And so you have a lot of severe underrepresentation for other folks that play out in the same ways that, you know, I kind of just described for women. Um, and, you know, it, it makes a big difference. And then there's, you know, generational impacts, right? And, and we know how big those are all the time, uh, you know, because everybody talks about generational differences. It's like a, you know, favorite pastime of all of ours. Um, but the average age of an adult U.S. worker is 33 and a half. But the average age of a machinist, 45.8. And that bell curve trends on the older side. This is where all the retirements become so risky. Um, and, you know, our sort of lack of success and sort of like drawing up at large scale, you know, younger folks into our industry, we're not, we're not catching up. And so this is why, you know, going back to the first question, like, why does it matter now? Well, we're looking down the barrel of a gun right now, really. At the ownership level. So that's, a, that's, that's just at the machining and, and um, you know, administrative level. At the ownership level, it's even worse. You know, it's even more one-sided. So um, when you are an industry that needs to, attract something different to survive but you've been doing something one way uh for so long it kind of our industry got to the point where a lot of things that are not accepted anywhere else are just like everyday happenstance right and uh we look past a lot of things or we you know um let a lot of things happen and brush it off as we're machinists um with the generational gap we have a huge uh, issue of old school, new school. It's, it's, it's every shop you walk into, there's old school, there's new school, right? And you hear that, that vernacular, you hear that language, and you've got the older uh, machinists with all the knowledge and stuff, and they're feeling like, uh, you know, they can't keep up with the technology, or these young guys are going to take their, you know, position. So we have these weird, like, hazing rituals and like these rites of passage that don't make you a better machinist, nine times out of 10, don't make you want to stay in the field. But, you know, in order to like, you know, feed your family or, you know, cross the burning sands of machining, you have to like go through these weird, you know, um, situations and like, like hazing rituals. And we are one of the only fields that, you know, that type of thing is, is kind of normal, you know? So um, we're super archaic. But because we've been that way for so long, it's like, that's what people expect and it's okay, right? So um, once we start doing things like, you know, 
putting people in positions and diversifying the field, that's how you attract the people that we need to fill these jobs. So um, if you can't see somebody anywhere past, you know, an operator that looks like you, you don't believe that this company is going to help you move through life and build your career. You don't believe that this industry is something that is a career. A lot of the um, shop owners that we consult with and speak to say, you know, they can get people to do applications. They can get people to come in and maybe start training for 30 days, but they don't stay. Maybe even 90 days, but they don't stay. And that's a blaring issue of culture. Once they get inside of the building, they're not seeing something that's going to be a return for their investment for their time. So people are in there. We're attracting them, but we can't keep them because inside the systems and the cultures and what we've been doing for so long are turning people away. And it's not even worth the money and it's not even worth the incentives that we're throwing to try to get people attracted to this industry. Because it, exactly like the, the culture ends up playing such a big part. And that doesn't mean like culture and diversity in this case are not the same thing. But thinking about, you know, demographic makeup of this space. So what happened to us, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, as all this outsourcing was going on. Tons and tons and tons of job loss. The way that you kept your job is by having more skills than the person next to you, right? It's like, you know, knock down a bee's nest. You just got to run faster than everybody else, right? That's how you, like, that's it. And so it creates a very, very competitive culture and insecurity around questioning of your ideas, right? And so what we ended up getting was this very sort of like guarded and, you know, often at times sort of aggressive work culture that's, that's, that's been developed here. You know, this, this is why, you know, we try to focus on collaborative engagements and, you know, why, you know, Joe, when I hear you, when, when I hear you pitch Chris's podcast, I'm like, yes, this is it, right? Like we're all community. And so, and, and this is the sort of expectation of the younger workforce. And you've seen other industries make this change already to, people focused, you know, leadership, right. Rather than just bottom line focused leadership. Um, and that's the move. That's the new yeah. man, American manufacturing renaissance and, and a T it's about collaboration. It's about this younger generation that's saying, Hey, you guys have not listened. You guys aren't listening. You're not letting us in, but we love this industry so much. We love American manufacturing so much. We understand how important it is. So we're going to take it amongst ourselves to just start doing it, to start collaborating with each other, to start sharing each other's platform, to start sharing everything um, that we do online to help it be more visible and to help people get in and see, you know, uh, podcasts like yours, see Chris Lukey, see, you know, my face, see Justin's face and hear about the things that. You might not see it in your, your, your immediate company. You might not see it immediately right now, but we're out here and we're making the changes, you know, and, and the, the results are going to speak for itself, right? So eventually when we keep going, we keep doing these things and people start knocking that door down, uh, everything is going to have to change, right? Because it's going to be financially viable and it's going to be, you know, sink or swim, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an exciting time, honestly. I mean, seeing, you know, getting to be a part of this change and then watching it happen and, you know, content like this, you know, these topics that we're talking about are the topics that have, it's everything under the sun has been talked about as the reasons for skills gap issues, except for this. And now it's happening. And, you know, it's, folks are getting excited to talk about it because there's a lot of people that have been thinking this way, but not really feeling like they had the space to talk about it this way. Um, and so. No, I think you're right. I, I think know. you guys are, I think you guys, the, the fact that you're shedding light on, on this and, and as it relates to this, the skilled labor gap and um, you know, the, the, the challenge that just about every manufacturer I'm talking to right now uh, is having is we, you know, we, we're, I talked to somebody this morning and, and she said, she's like, I used to get excited when orders came in and now I just freak out because how are we going to get them done? Right. And, and here you are with, with, um, you know, a perception of manufacturing that it's you know, the, the dirty, dark, dangerous thing. Right. And, and you've got a lot of people out there who could be, uh, who, who could be engaging. I mean, Drew, you, you, I know your work 
uh, at Rankin and, and uh, you've been engaged. I mean, you are an African-American male in St. Louis working with the youth to get them interested in manufacturing. And, and I mean, what, what better place to go? I'm just curious, what do you see in from, what do you see in from young folks as, as you, all of a sudden you shed light on what a manufacturing career could look like and you show them your path. Like, what do you see and how are people responding to that? Is there excitement? It's overwhelming because um, when I was younger and I was in the field and, you know, I was trying to figure things out and teach myself, it was very hard going through all of these uh, things that come along with being the only other person, right? And then it was something that I didn't encourage people to get into. I didn't even really talk about what I did because you know, I didn't want other people to go through these same situations trying to pursue, you know, a check or, you know, a better life, you know. But once, you know, I found myself in a position where I could start making some changes and I started consulting with companies and speaking to them, I saw that most companies in our field want to do something. They know that it's an issue and they want to, to, to fix this thing. Uh, the best that they can, right? Um, so that was very encouraging. And then as I started getting out into the field and I say, okay, the companies are going to hire you guys. They want, you know, to, to give you an opportunity. They want to, you know, help you, um, you know, get into this field. And I start telling these young people what this field is and they see what it's done for my life. And I can show them real positions and real careers on the back end where they can apply these skills and these companies aren't just, you know, you know, just random names. These are companies that are local that they know and that they know that they've seen somebody work there that went through my program. And it's, it's becoming more real to them every day. Um, and then with the new technology that's coming in, Industry 4.0, they're so excited because now they're seeing that the skill set that they have and they grew up, you know, honing is covered in this field is going to be something that is going to help push this field forward. So there's an excitement as far as, you well, know, it's like a wow able, yeah, yeah, like to get yeah. into it, an exciting factor of like, wow, I didn't even know that this thing existed. Yeah. Uh, it's a career that's going to take care of me, like in a good way. And I can grow, I can go to sales, I can go to programming, I can go to prototyping, whatever they want to do. There's so many options. And it's a whole new world that's open to them. And, and more importantly, what's more exciting for me is their path isn't going to be, you know, like my path or like many people's path before me who came from, you know, maybe the other side of the tracks or, you know, came from, you know, where minorities are just whatever it may be, you know, uh, because this is an issue and there's people like us now that are fighting the fight and talking the talk and making sure that, you know, these 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 companies are receiving them well and setting them up and giving them a platform to, to, to show their skills and, you know, uh, be a part of the company. So it's amazing. Um, on top of that, um, when I get a student that comes in or just a person that comes in nine times out of 10, it's not because they have, you know, a particular interest in manufacturing or maybe they didn't even know Nine times out of ten, they didn't know anything about it, right? It's really the um, the 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 career and the life change that's tied to getting into this field. So when I get a kid that knows nothing, and then in you know two semesters, four semesters, he's working in the field, and now he's running five axis machines and like you know EDMs and like you know all these different things that he had no idea existed. And he's getting paid twenty dollars an hour. You know, it's uh, it's life changing. And and they they call me and they're so excited. And they always thank me. But with manufacturing, I don't. I can't run the machines for you. I can't. You know, you know, hit your numbers. I can't. You know, uh, program for you. They do that. So you know, they thank me. But this is what manufacturing does. Don't thank me. Thank the industry. Right. That's great, guys. So you've hit on. Um you've hit on diversity from a few angles. What, like how would, when we say diversity, 
what, what does that mean to you guys? What are we talking about? You know, is, is it, it's not just about race. It's not just about male or female, um, or, or age. Like it's what, what everything. It, it's everything. So t- tell me more, unpack that a little bit. Tell us, tell me, tell us more about that. Yeah. So, you know, gender and race are like really sort of quick and easy to go to, but you know, these sort of common culture isn't particularly, you know, queer accepting as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Or, some jobs can be hard to make accommodations for disabled folks, but not all of them. And we see lots of social enterprises really doing a great job there. And so it's about like this, this idea of just overall inclusivity, right? Like mm-hmm. making, making these spaces sort of like accommodating and welcoming to everybody. And it really like boils down essentially to like empathy, right? Sort of like the ability to kind of, you know, see the other person, quote unquote, right? That's really what everybody needs. And when it's when we're talking about sort of like communication efforts on these topics, that's typically where the challenge lies is folks aren't actually seeing, you know, the other person, right? They're seeing like their their perception of the other person, but that's, you know, not actually based in reality. So messages get sent, but they're not received in the way that, that they are sent. And so that's that's the thing that we're really trying to sort of like do a lot of work around is you know, talk about these things in relatable ways, discuss, you know, some of the demographic changes and the sort of like overall sort of like macro level stuff that made everything what it is, because none of this is something that anybody, like any one person bears any responsibility for. And, and this is where, you know, Drew and I and others like us can really kind of like help a lot because you know, there's that adage, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so I see a lot of very well-intentioned efforts fall flat because, you know, the folks that are making the decisions around what those efforts look like aren't connected enough to really like know what, you know, their, their target, you know, audience actually needs. And so we see, again, like lovely kind of well-intentioned kind of efforts, but that just completely miss the mark. And in some cases end up like working against them, which is like that, that hurts because then that becomes a discouraging factor. And, and so, um, so, you know, I guess, You know, if you're a business leader that's listening to this, that, you know, you want to do something, but you're not really sure, like take the time to reach out to a consultant of some kind and and get that help. Because I promise you, if you were confused right now, you're not ready to make those choices and you want you want some help kind of learning everything that you need to need to know to do all this stuff the right way. Um, Let me give you a couple of examples. Right. So. um I spoke to a company, uh, uh, an owner of a company in the South. And uh, the owner was like, you know, I'm having this problem, you know, getting the workers and and keeping the workers. And um, also, you know, I try to get workers skilled up and, you know, um, upskilled, you know, to, you know, not just be operators, but program in different languages and all of that. Right. And. Um, he was like, out of, I think it was like 78 people that were eligible, only four went through the training program and he couldn't understand why nobody wanted to take this. And he put a, a ton of effort into this and Lots of effort, aligned right? with standards and just did a lot of work. But and, and I asked him, I said, well, when someone goes through the program, how do you incentivize them? Or how do you show them that, you know, this was, you know, something that we covered as a company? And he said, well, we give them um, a token. And then- Challenge uh, coin specifically. Challenge coin, yes. And then we put their name on on a ticker in the lunchroom. And we called them out like, you know, clap and all that. And um, those types of things are things where maybe his generation uh, really coveted, right? So yeah. his generation he even said, you know, I would go to work and I'd work my butt off to get one of those things and I take pride in it. This is a different generation, right? So his generation had a lot of those uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy needs met by their entry level jobs. There was a strong middle class, right? So um, he didn't have all of the same needs that the youth have today. So a coin may have been something at that time that meant a lot. But today, kids are struggling with high costs of housing, um, you know, food. They're struggling with real deal things 
uh, where their dollar isn't really stretching as far as his generation. So a coin, they can't feed their kids with it. They can't take it uh, to another, to the bank. They can't take it to another company to recognize that. So it's really kind of meaningless. And that's why people don't want to do it. But we have to talk to the youth and allow them a safe opportunity to talk back and let us know what they need so that we can help each other and collaborate. Another one was a company that has a location in the South and then they have a location up North in Minnesota or something, right? And they were like, you know, our company in the South, 500 CNC machines, all full. Minnesota, we can't get anybody. We try to get people from, you know, neighboring towns and all that. And um, I suggested, why don't you offer housing and do an internship program over the summer? And if you offer housing, you can lower the pay and people will come out there and then they'll be able to see over the summer what it's like and they'll be more likely to stay on after they graduate or, you know, the apprentice program or anything like that. He couldn't understand it. He was like, oh, no, never worked. I came immediately to the machinists who are looking for jobs in my classroom. I said, hey, guys, what are things that would make you go to a company and stay there? in light of like high pay or a location that you like. The number one thing that they said was housing. Housing is important to the youth these days. So not saying that, you know, um, everything has to be changed and everything has to be flipped on its head or everything has to be, you know, uh, you know, different and we have to do everything that they want us to do going forward. It's not about appeasing anybody. It's about saying, hey, I need you, you need me, we need some things together and I can help you and you can help me. Mm -hmm. And as we grow this thing and we close this skills gap, we can reassess and see what it looks like then. Now, how do we move forward? But the first thing we have to do is say, hey, this is not old American machining. Old American machining and those old systems and how we came up, this isn't it anymore and if we continue to operate the way that we've been operating, we're pushing the youth away, especially in this digital age where, you know, they could stay at home and they can, you know, 3D design for somebody else. They can do whatever they want to. They have mobility with, with, with jobs going more online, Zoom, all of these different things that we are accustomed to using and they're experts at using after you know a year and a half two years of staying at home every day doing these types of things they're digital wizards so mm -hmm. if there's anything that they don't like in a particular job or a particular shop they don't have to stay they can go because every shop needs machinists so they have the, the the mobility that we didn't have back then so this is a whole nother class and group of people that have a ton of different issues and, and situations that weren't the same for us. So unless we speak to them in a way that, that we can understand and we're receiving what they're saying to us, we're not going to understand and we're not going to set them up, you know, to, to, to come here or to stay here. Well, what you're saying here, Drew, that is just sticking out to me and, and just kind of screaming at me loud and clear is we need to listen. And, you know, Justin, earlier you, you mentioned the word empathy, and I think that sums it up pretty well, right? Like we need to understand that, you know, the workforce and what they want from us and how that's changed over the course of a generation plus and listen to them. I think your example of, of the housing example is, is just amazing because, I mean, here you have an organization that can't find people to do the job and is ma they're making assumptions about what people want. You go back to your classroom and ask, just ask them, right? What, what would you guys want? Housing. We need housing. Like that would be, that would be amazing. If we had housing that would take us out of our city and put us in another city for a job. If we knew that that could, could be taken care of. And I mean, you know, you think of the cost, the, the opportunity cost of, of not being able to fulfill orders. You think of, you know, these machines sitting here empty, right? With nobody on them. You think of the, what they're probably spending to recruit in other ways. And, and here you have a very simple need that, and yeah, of course there's a cost to that, but when the you put it up, 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly like you said. And then yeah. on top of that, we know that um, you know, studies show in, in every industry that workers that feel happy and they feel respected produce way more, almost like 3x, you know. So um that's gonna open your margins. And and again, this is a digital culture, these are kids, right? So information spreads so fast. That's 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 what they do, you know. So so if we do things like that, the first thing that they're going to do is put it on Reddit or they're going to put it on Instagram or they're going to put it on all of these places where they are. And that's going to be the thing. Right. So, yo, you know, you can go and go work for this company, hang out out here and they'll pay for your housing. And nine times out of ten, you know, the kids will, will take half of what you would pay another machinist, you know, to be up there that you don't know is going to stay, you know. so. Um, it, it's, it's simple things that won't even take like a, a chunk out of your budget. It's just rearranging the same money that you're paying people now, like you said. So, um, we've got to see these things just in a different light. Another thing, you know, um, our industry is big on, I don't need a website. I don't need a digital presence. I don't need, you know, these things, word of mouth. These are the same contracts my grandpa has been running. We've been running these things for Speaking years. Speaking of Joe's expertise right now. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so we, we, we on, on the, the youth and, and in attracting the, the talent side, the first thing that kids these days are going to do if a job offers them or they're looking for a machine shop to work in, they're going to Google. They're going to Google. They're going to Siri. They're going to look it up, right? And as they Google, they're going to look for an, a website. And for these kids, that's normal for them. They've been shopping online. They've been watching videos online. They've been teaching themselves online. They become millionaires online, right? So these kids, the first thing that they do is hop online and they check machining, right? Or they check specifically your, your company. And if they see an old website, that's going to turn them off, right? So they think, old website, antiquated company, old machines, don't want to go there, right? Mm -hmm. No matter if that's true or not, or they don't see a website, the first thing that they're going to see from your company most likely is an Indeed review or a Glassdoor review. And if they have something bad to say about your company, or if the reviews don't look like something that a young person who's eager and wants to get into the field is going to want to see, you're cut out there too. And they'll talk about it online, right? So where you don't have a digital presence, they're going to put one for you and they get to control what it's saying or what it's not saying, right? right? So, um, you know, small changes, small changes that we see and we have, you know, um, an idea from other industries, diversifying, going digital, having web presence, doing digital content, it all gives you return on investment. And we have case study after case yeah. study after case study there's data to quantify it you know? don't do it right so um you know we got to make the change we got to make the change and you know it's not just for the youth but it's for the companies as well yeah so i guess let's like hit some of that so 15 percent more likely to have above average profitability if you're if you have diverse a diverse company this one's bigger a 35 percent performance advantage if you have a gender diverse executive team versus not. Mm -hmm. And this is just like, it's an immediate kind of pocketbook piece. Um, you know, gender diverse teams outperform by 21%. So you've got like above average profitability. So that 15% number, you're moving up the bell curve. You have a 35% performance advantage. And this is like, you get diversity of thought. And, and that's, you know, that, that's the thing that the company really benefits from. And then employees are benefiting from being in a more accepting and welcoming place. I mean, you know, it's like, think about the difference of what it's like to, you know, exist in, you know, sort of a, an anxious headspace because, you know, people are aggressive or you don't feel like they're seeing you at all. You know, they're constantly saying stuff that is like clearly not what they ought to be, but you can't, you just have to be there and bear it or, you know, what have you. Right. Um, or, you know, again, like aggressive aggressive workspace versus, you know, being happy for the third of your life that you're committing to your career, you know, like, 
the health benefits that that has. I mean, it's the changes in organizational culture have like deep and vast and like interconnected kind of like positive outcomes when you go towards that, that model Mm -hmm. um, of people focused leadership. And that looks like, you know, folks can look this kind of stuff up, like servant leadership, humble leadership, approaching things in uh, vulnerable and humble ways and helping kind of uh, create relationships with your staff so that they actually feel comfortable coming to you and, you know, you create good feedback loops where you get, you get data coming from everybody all the time, letting you know, like, what's good, what's not, it makes your company more agile. Like you, you become quicker to respond to things. Um, but then again, you also have these differences in ideas and, and this, and those difference in the differences in ideas are the things that, you know, along with some of the others directly contribute to those performance advantages. And, um, you know, women on, on leadership teams, you know, if, if, if we think about the sort of like standard kind of tropey stuff that, that, that might be out there, you know, around what, what male leadership looks like versus female leadership. If we're talking about, you know, servant leadership, humble leadership, vulnerable leadership being sort of the, the more productive model here, like it, it almost makes immediate sense, you know, how, how this works. Um, but, you know, companies need to make, you know, really specific and kind of direct changes move with a lot of intention, like going forward and, and, you know, thinking about empathy. I mean, that's like, you know, all directions, you know, like people do have to be given kind of this space to fail because that's where learning occurs. You know, the couple of the best places that I've ever worked that performed to insane levels, like quite literally, like, I mean, cutting down lead times on complex projects from like two weeks to two days, like nobody else, nobody else was even able to come close to that. And it was through this sort of like fail fast mentality, right? Like we, we support failure, right? That's, this is where we learn and then we become the best this way. Right. But like old school thoughts were like, Oh, you know, if, if you do something wrong, like, you know, we got to chew your ass and the next time you're out, you know, even if it's like totally different context and, you know, person's learning and growing. I mean, it's, everybody makes mistakes. They got to have room to, right. Um, I do want to make this point as well. um, That, uh, diversity include and inclusion is not assimilation. So when he talks about empathy, mm-hmm. diversity and inclusion doesn't mean hire women that act like us here or hire, you know, black and brown people that act like our culture, that do the same things that we're doing that are bad, right? So what, what the target here is and to get this return on you know on the diversification and all of those things um you have to get people and uh you have to empower who they naturally are and their what makes them diverse right so you know uh um you know not saying you know like um this guy is is hired here because he drives the same trucks as us he hunts and, you know, he's got a Confederate flag on his toolbox too. hire him. You know what I'm saying? So it's more so of who's the best person for the job. Do they have skills? Can they do this job? And then we covet the uniqueness about where they come from or who they are that is different than what we have here. And we, we take their differences into account and they take ours into account. So when we're having these meetings or we're having, um, you know, programming meetings or we're trying to figure out a setup or we're, you know, trying to do these things is not all of the people like us put into it and not this person. You know, everybody in all of the angles are considered uh, equally. And then you build from there. And and like Justin said, that empathy allows you to have the empathy and the safe space of being able to fail safely allows you to have a penetration uh, uh, of understanding at every level of your company, right? So if if the, the saw guy knows that his job is secure, knows that even though he does not maybe look like or come from or speak the language or, you know, do the same activities outside of work as everybody else in here, my opinion 
and my, you know, when I say, hey, this could be better, it holds the same weight as everybody else. And I'm not going to lose my job because of that. So guys, I can't help but to think that some percentage of those people listening right now are thinking with fully good intentions, okay, yeah, this diversity issue in manufacturing is a problem, but I'm trying to keep the lights on here and I'm trying to build a profitable business and I can't make this a priority with all the other fires I'm trying to put out and the things we're trying to achieve as a company. What can you guys say to that? Knowing that probably a lot of people, a lot of leaders in manufacturing organizations probably would like to embrace diversity. Maybe they just don't know where to start or how to, how to start moving toward building a more diverse organization and, and they're feeling overwhelmed. Like what actionable advice can you give them to get them moving in the right direction? So the, to tackle the first part of the question that you asked there, um, I would just kind of want to bring it back to right where we started. Like your organization is going to struggle to, stru- to survive if you don't take actionable steps. You know, in the short term, it's going to look exactly like it did, but eventually you're going to see others grow and you won't folks leave your shop to go work at others, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it, it's going to be important and it's going to hit you where it hurts for sure. Um, things that you can do. So, um, and when we talk about like hiring a consultant, what a, what a consultant would do is sort of like come in talk to you about what your goals might be, um, like, you know, do an audit and then make sort of like nuanced kind of contextual recommendations. But there's some sort of like overarching kind of generalized things that can definitely be done, which is, you know, introducing work flexibility wherever you can for those sorts of things, right? That's a, that's a huge, like, top, top item, specifically for like millennial generation and younger, like work-life balance, super, super important. Um, From sort of like the cultural inclusivity, sort of like aspects of things, like modifying your holiday policy to not just, you know, focus on, you know, the sort of like traditional holidays that we've kind of like grown up with because those aren't the holidays that everybody celebrates. And that actually has never really been the case. It's just only one type really have. And so you can modify things to give folks a lot of like flex days for holidays. So they get the opportunity to choose for themselves and the, and the ownership over all of that, right? Like that, that's a big, big piece too. Um, and then, you know, start doing some studying around, you know, organizational culture change and sort of like like leadership just in general from this sort of like servant leadership aspect you know when you when you change over to people first leadership like you benefit even out of this entire process and um and you know getting i guess you know finding that point that i lost earlier for a moment um you know that that disparate perspective piece you don't know what you don't know everybody benefits when everybody is around different folks because now you sort of, you, you start building, you know, intrinsic understanding and, and, you know, exposure to things that expand your perspective. And so, you know, the, the business is benefiting, but every single person in that organization benefits in a strong way, with their own personal development through their abilities, kind of like understand folks that come from different backgrounds. If connected to them. Um, but I want to draw back to that, but yeah, Drew, jump in. Um, So I would say uh, number one is to do exactly what you just said. Say, I want to change it. It's important to me. I don't know how. As soon as you say, I don't know how, then that means you begin to either look for that knowledge or seek somebody that already has it, that's already doing it, right? And in manufacturing, like you said, there's so many fires all day, every day. And most manufacturing executives are great at that, being a manufacturing executive. And if they could make the change, we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in right now. So you keep being great at what you're great at and say, I don't know this, but it's important and and we need to do this. And then talk to somebody that does. Reach out and connect and collaborate with people that do. Reach out and connect and collaborate with other shops in your immediate area that may, you know, be doing some things that are working, right? And um, collaborate with 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 schools, collaborate with the um, local like Urban League and, and, and find where the workers are. There is a, a youth jobless situation going on as well. Like there's there's youth people, there's 
There's teenagers that want to work. There's, you know, 20 to 24 year olds that want to work, right? They may not want to flip burgers. They don't want to work the retail jobs, but manufacturing is none of that. And we're paying higher wages. They just don't know that it's here. And if they do know that it's here and they might have tried it, then they might, you know, not have been accepted. So they're back home, but they want to work. Everybody wants to work. You know what I'm saying? So they're here. Connect with them. If you have a machine that has work and it's not running, it's not making you money right now. It's costing you money. So put that machine into one of these community organizations, teach somebody there or have hire somebody to start teaching people how to run those parts. And now you have production and you have a pipeline of workers that can come. So it's all about collaboration. It's all about saying, I don't know how to do this. But most importantly, it's about saying that I need to prioritize this because I can almost guarantee that most of the fires that they would be putting out wouldn't be fires if this thing was taken care of a while ago, right? Um, we all so, need to contribute. Absolutely. So and think we're about, you know, where it's that bad. Yeah. We, we got to work together now, you know? It's, so uh, I want to talk about workforce development programs. So, you know, it's a background, you know, Drew, Drew and I both have a background in this, but uh, connect with them, you know, connect with your technical colleges, connect with the trades programs that are in your area, become an advisory board member. That stuff helps a lot. It helps them. It helps you. They get access to the information that they, they need so that they're delivering on what the industry wants out of, out of the students that are coming out of their programs. They get the support. They get thought diversity with the more people that are coming in to, to do that. And, you know, you become a part of that collaborative collaborative effort to help grow everything. Because, you know, really with all this reshoring pressure and, you know, we've got bills in the works that are going to be bringing a lot more like attention to manufacturing. There's going to be money like getting doled out to apprenticeship, apprenticeships, like those apprenticeships, if they're going to succeed, they, they need support. And we don't really need to be competing in the, in the ways that we're used to. Like we are going to be living in a period of abundance. There's going to be more work than we're capable of delivering on. we got to work together to figure out how to do that. Because if we don't, that work's going to go right back to where we were trying to get it from. And we're going to be in the same position we were. And we're not going to have that strong manufacturing base that we want in this country. Well, Andrew, Justin, this was an amazing and incredibly important conversation today. I have a ton of respect for both of you guys and what you're doing. I really appreciate you coming on the show to spread the message um, that you're working so hard to get out there in the manufacturing community. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for thanks for having us, Joe. And uh, yeah, um, I'll be seeing you around town for sure because uh, I'll be I'll be in St. Louis a lot more frequently nowadays. That's that's great to hear. Um, can each of you guys? Quick, yeah, please go ahead. While we're throwing around, thank yeah. you. You're important, and thank you. You know, the more yeah, you are. have people committed to building platforms like this, people committed to you know uh, promoting platforms like this, seeking out people that are that are that have important opinions. And, and, you know, the thought leaders that are, that are changing the field um, it is, is, is highly coveted and it's so important to us and it's so important to the industry as a whole that we have these opportunities, you know, to have places that we can speak about this and, you know, they're, they're real and they're authority figures in the field. So, you know, thank you for your dedication to, you know, manufacturing. Thank you, you know, for you know, building this show and building this platform and continuing to build it and promote it and find the best people to put on it um, because we need it, man. So, so thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you saying that. It's, it's my pleasure to do so. It's an honor to, uh, to bring guys like you who are doing good in the world on here and uh, again, to spread your message. So if I can give the platform for that, then um, good. At least I'm doing something here, right? Awesome. Well, I, I would love for both of you to tell our audience how they can get in touch with each of you and also just a little bit about each of your respective organizations, because you guys are both uh, social entrepreneurs right now and, and both doing some really interesting things, both in collaboration, but on your own as well. So um, talk about that a little bit uh, before we part ways. Yeah, so I think the uh, easiest way to reach me is likely going to be on LinkedIn. Uh, so we had a few different things going on. But if, uh, you know, if you're interested in Equity Machine Works or learning more about what that is, uh, you can go to equitymachine.works. Uh, we got you know new age website address. 
Um, and you know, our, our social enterprise is really focused on creating a workforce development program that creates those that those collaborative engagements with outreach groups, pre-apprenticeship groups, apprenticeship groups, uh, industry organizations like local government, kind of create a pipeline for folks that uh, creates opportunity for disadvantaged populations and also works to increase the diversity within our within our industry. Um, through you know, a variety of compounding strategies and breaking down barriers and addressing what might be some key challenges for folks that, you know, say, you know, if you're living in poverty, you're going to have that list of, you know, housing, housing access, food access, transportation access, those things are going to be potentially problematic and nuanced, right? You might need to have tailored solutions for, for each person. So that's, that's part of what we want to be doing with along our pipeline is to make sure that people are supported. So, you know, Drew mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs earlier, you know, if core needs aren't met, you can't really go on to the next level. So make sure those are met. Now we're focusing on education. Now we're building ourselves up and then there's, we're going to hit a point where self-sustenance is there and the rest is history, you know? And so uh, it, what it looks like is in going, going from, from outreach into pre-apprenticeship, completing pre-apprenticeship training, joining our program, year long OJT, you complete your first year of apprenticeship. And at the end of that year, you get placement services out into you know a partner company, and that creates space for an opportunity for somebody else, and then scale that up, show others how to do something similar. Um, there's there's a lot of opportunity to do things like this, and definitely about helping anybody set up systems like that produce positive change for all of us. All right, so if you want to get in touch with me, um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well, Andrew Crow. Uh, C-R-O-W-E. And right now I am on the cusp of launching uh, our first uh, pilot program for Elevate Institute of Advanced Manufacturing, uh, which is a smart factory industry 4.0 um, factory and workforce training center. And we are really focused on uh, areas like St. Louis, where there is high crime and there is high youth unemployment. And we are using manufacturing and American manufacturing to turn those things around and get in these inner cities and build them back up, uh, bring the jobs back, um, bring, you know, the tax money back, uh, build the schools up better and, um, you know, just use American manufacturing to, to change America, man. And, uh, you know, we're going to do the first one here in St. Louis. And then we are looking at cities like D.C., in Chicago and um, Detroit, where manufacturing um, can do the same thing. Um, so I am uh, working closely with companies like the Urban League, um, foundations, I mean, like the Urban League um, and local organizations, um, the Youth Detention Center. Um, I'm working with some um, uh, youth motherhood, single mother groups and um, the local city CTE program uh, for the high school. And we're just bringing that awareness, bringing these opportunities and bringing this access and bringing them back to the inner cities uh, to get you know some of these people that have been passed over a good career and a good start um, on, on some generational changes. In addition to that, we are putting the finishing touches on a uh, manufacturing trailer. You've seen a couple of these um, popping up all over and they're really great ideas um, to put it in people's faces. And we're going to go to um, the, the local institutions and penitentiaries and put manufacturing um, on the map that way. I know Titan um, was one of the main proponents of, you know, from, from prison to the, to the machine shop and thriving that way. Um, I am, am a felon myself. I, you know, earlier in my life, I didn't have the access and, and the opportunities and I made some bad decisions and manufacturing changed my life as well. So um, it's something that's more of a personal mission. Um, but I think that, you know, um, it's, it's, it's an opportunity for people that want to change and want to, you know, do better and rebuild. It's the perfect opportunity. So, um, that that's what I'm on. I'm going across America and pushing this new American manufacturing renaissance. 
I love it, guys. Well, once again, thank you for your time today. Thanks for bringing this message. And as for the rest of you, I hope to catch you on the next episode of the Manufacturing Executive. 